Good morning, everybody. Good to see so many people here uh, for this uh, colloquium. I hope uh, I, I'm think it's going to be a very interesting day. First of all, I would like to welcome also uh, uh, people from outside our region, from outside Europe. There is someone from Colombia, Nigeria, New Zealand. So apparently, this is a, a subject that is. Uh, uh, very interesting, far beyond uh, our region. But we as uh, EPO, the European and Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization, uh, would like to welcome everybody and also uh, from outside our region. It's also good to know that it's not only UFRESCO members that are present here, but even from, our, from within our region, there are people that uh, are not uh, part of the UFRESCO member organization. Uh, of course, they can always uh, uh, become a member. <laughs> Contact Baldi on that. He will tell you everything. Uh, EPO is actually hosting uh, uh, UFRESCO. It's part of EPO's work. Uh, and uh, therefore, we are organizing this colloquium together, UFRESCO with EPO. Uh, and uh, yeah, of course, the subject of this uh, colloquium is very interesting. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of developments on the molecular level. Uh, in the past years, uh, data become more and more rapidly available. And of course, then it's also uh, an issue of uh, what is the meaning of this data? Uh, what is the meaning of this data for, for the organism, uh, for the pest? Uh, but also, and, uh, what is the meaning of this data and the, the consequences for the organism for the crops. So it, it, the plant health uh, consequences of uh, the, all these data and all these findings are also very important. <coughs> and therefore, it's very nice today to have both uh, scientists here, well represented, but also people that are more from the plant health regulatory side. Because we think it's important that uh, uh, there is a discussion on what do these findings mean for uh, the plant health and for our crop and our environment. So it's important to have this discussion, uh, uh, to make this link and discuss together uh, what it means what we find. Or if we can't tell now, how we could work towards uh, uh, getting more uh, s uh, understanding of, say, the, f the plant health risk of uh, the findings we do on what we look at our level. And I know there are a lot of developments already. I know there is also a lot to be uh, understood yet. Uh, but I, uh, we ho I hope this, uh, this day and this interaction and discussions and, of course, the, the presentations we'll have today will be uh, 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 helpful in uh, understanding uh, the, the findings and the research results, uh, but also uh, the consequences for plant health in general. With this, uh, I would like to give the floor to Bart, who is going to Bart van Rosenberg from the Netherlands, who is going to lead uh, the program today and introduce the, the speakers, and I guess also watch the time. <laughs> thank you, Bart. So, uh, thank you, Nico, for uh, uh, handing over the floor. Um, and uh, so also I would like to uh, extend my warm welcome to everybody here in the audience um, that you made it all the way to Paris, uh, to the UNESCO building. So we have a, a very exciting program ahead of us. Um, so, but first for those who do not know me, I'll quickly introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Bart van der Vossenberg. I'm a lead uh, molecular biologist at the Dutch, Dutch National uh, Plant Protection Organization. And uh, in our lab, we have uh, diagnostic and applied research activities on a very broad range of quarantine pests. So uh, also under our activities, uh, we are increasingly using uh, new sequencing techniques for uh, research, but also in diagnostics. Uh, and with these new sequencing technologies, very exciting new questions uh, raised. So, uh, what is the relevance of those identified species, as Nico already mentioned, and can we look beyond species and look at function from those uh, sequence data sets? 
So these questions uh, lie at the basis of, uh, of this colloquium. So we'll have seven uh, presentations today, seven uh, different speakers uh, from a broad range of, of different types of pests, which is a good thing. Uh, and also uh, at the end of the meeting, we'll have a, a presentation on fair uh, data use and sharing uh, principles. Um, before I'll start introducing the first speaker, uh, this is a good opportunity for all of you to look at your phones, tablets, and laptop computer and switch off any sound that you maybe still have uh, turned on. I'll give you a few seconds for that. So, um, so we'll have the seven different presentations. And instead of having a, uh, a question and answer session at the end of each presentation, uh, we would like to ask you to save up your questions that you have for the different uh, presenters, uh, because then they will be um, addressed in one of the two discussion sessions that we have. So to give sufficient time to all of the speakers um, to present their work and to have a plenary discussion because I think what we'll notice is that there will be many cross links between the different talks and the questions that we'll raise from those talks. So without further ado, um, I would like to invite um, Sebastian uh, Massard from the University of Liège to the stage to present his work uh, on the genome-based pest risk assessment of newly discovered plant viruses. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Bart, and thank you very much also for the uh, organizer, the PPO in the Fresco, for uh, inviting me to share uh, our work on this point of what do we do with all this uh, genome sequence. So, first of all, let me introduce a bit this new era, the genome era. Um, what's the current impact? What's, what does it mean exactly? Alors, first of all, imagine you're on Amazon. You're looking for nice discounts, and you get one advertisement. You have a super sale with a super reduction, a reduction of 99.99999% of the price. With, in addition, you have a better quality of what you look for. And in fact, it, what it is what was happening with the genome and the sequencing, more sequencing genome or transcriptome, whatever. The price has dropped so much in this recent year that, in fact, what's happening when you have something which is cheap and affor affordable, in fact, the scientists are now sequencing everything that is living on Earth. And you have this kind of big genome project, the Earth Biogenome Project, etc., etc. The idea is to sequence life somewhere. So sequencing life is nice, but us, as a plant pathologist or plant pest specialist, we are also sequencing for identifying potential pests or identifying viruses that are belonging to plants. So one, of, one example of this uh, rise in the number of samples, the number of sequences that you can generate is a, a project that is currently ongoing in Belgium, this is Seviplan, funded by the Ministry of uh, Health. In this project, in fact, we want to scan the virome, all the viruses present in several commodities. And more specifically, we, we, in that case, focus on the Solanaceae family. We have sampled 17,000 samples, 17,000 plants of Solanaceae that are coming from crops, potato, tomato, eggplants, that are coming from white plants, like the black nightshade, and also ornamental. And we are currently sequencing them through improved protocol, which means that in middle term, they will be like the Solanacea virus Wikipedia in Belgium. And this is one concrete example of what's happening 
when the scientists decide to sequence what everything is living. We can, hunt, we, we can have much more information on the viruses circulating in Belgium. This huge amount of, of information is nice, but that means also that we have more and more sequence in the database. And you can see here the trend of sequences. You have here the number of sequences in the biggest worldwide database. And you see clearly since the beginning of high throughput sequencing, you have a steep increase of that. We are now with a lot, a lot of data to manage, to handle. This means also that we have a new stakeholder. These new stakeholders, this is the bioinformaticians that are taking power somewhere, that are appearing among us. And to, to work with that, uh, we have set up a Nefresco project, which is the PHBN project. It is coordinated by Annelise Hagemans from ILVO, and we are already 28 partners. I make a call, by the way, if you know bioinformaticians active in plant health, they can contact us because the biggest, the network is, the, the network is the best. The best it is to share. And this Fresco project, we have three main objectives. We want to develop training material, like how to guide, beginner's guide, in order for any scientist to be able to step in this data analysis. We want also to, to, to have a bioinformatic challenge. We will create specific sample data and all the people, these 28 people and maybe more, we analyze this, this data in order to find, to, in, to identify better what is an appropriate analysis of the data, how we can analyze the data smartly that, so that they represent what's in the sample. And finally, we will also have effort of data mining. Overall, behind these three objectives, the goal of this project is in fact to seed to, 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 to start the net networking for a new stakeholder. Uh, the bioinformatics is arriving in our area. So first to have this, the bioinformaticians speaking with each other, discussing with each other, but also with the other stakeholders of plant health. So we are sequencing a lot of pest genome. What's happening with the known pests? And in fact, if you have a look on the numbers in database, the number of genome sequence from viruses and bacteria are rising very quickly. The increase is much, it's a lower pace for fungal of, or, or insect of viruses. Some example, let's have a look on the plum pox virus. We have 271 full genome sequence in the database. For the Ralstonia salinosarum bacteria, we have 102 full genome sequence. And a third example, which is not a regulated uh, organism, uh, the PVY, we have 444 genome sequence. So for each pest, we will have genomes by hundreds in the database um, available. Okay, I explained you, we sequence more and more. We have more and more genomes in the tab database. What can we do with these genomes? And I will focus here on genomes of known virus, but it can be also uh, extended to other pests in the future. I will also, to, to go on concrete uh, work, explain you the outputs of such a project. And more specifically, it's another Fresco project, Uravulge, this end uh, this year, with seven partners, but also 14 collaborating countries and coordinated by Chris de Jong, who is uh, among us today. We worked on the little cherry viruses one and two, uh, responsible of uh, the little cherry disease. And what we wanted to do is to sequence as much genome as possible in order to improve the diagnostic and also to compare the diversity, the isolate present within European Union with the isolate present in other parts of the world. And for that, we make a lot of networking. We rely on very uh, strong collaboration with scientists around the world. It allows us to have 94 samples from 22 countries belonging to five continents. So we had the starting material to study the diversity of this disease at worldwide level. To have a look, if we, to see the impact of this kind of collaborative project and how in two years we can really change what is present in database, have a look here, the number of sequence that were present, number of genomes in the database when starting the project was 16 for little cherry virus one and five for little cherry virus two. And what we see, 
after the project, all the data are not yet published in the database, but we will publish. We have 50, uh, 51 for literature virus 1 and 33 for the 2, which means an increase of three times and six times the number of genomes available in two, three years. Once we have this genome, we can go for the next step, which is, in fact, I will um, align this genome, compare all these genomes together, and look for the position where I have primers, primers that are used by the diagnostic laboratory to detect these viruses. And we have here the example for five primer pair. Here you have the average number of mismatch, which is the mutation between the sequence of your isolate and your primer. Depending on this position, the mismatch can um, create false negative because the primer cannot hybridate and we cannot, you cannot detect the virus. There, the number of mismatch is variable. Here, for example, it's newest primers that have been published. And you see there are already less mismatches than older primers that were designed where they, when there was not so much a genome sequence. Based on that, if you look more practically, you could see here on the alignment in yellow, this is where we have mismatches for one of the primer. And we put in red the, ex the three prime extremity, which is the most important to ensure the hybridization and therefore the detection. So there, what, we are, what, we are, what can be done here, and it's uh, currently under, uh, under progress and finishing, is that we can now evaluate on the whole genome on so many isolates, how we can, wh which region, in fact, is the less variable, which region is the most conserved, and we have samples from everywhere in the world. So based on that, it's possible to design primers that have less mismatch, and so will allow a more reliable identification, lower the risk of false negative. That's for the diagnostic part. The other part is, oh, EU and non-EU is isolate of, the, of both viruses. Here is an example for little cherry virus one. You can see here, we make a clustering of these viruses with, in fact, there is five main group for little cherry virus one. You have in blue, this is the isolate from the European Union, and in red, the isolates that come from outside the European Union. Overall, here, the result, you see there is quite a mix of isolates. What we, you could have is small clusters. For example, here we have a cluster of isolates that seems to, to be EU young only, or some isolates from outside here that are a bit distant or far from other isolates. Again here, uh, the, we have this kind of uh, clustering, this kind of comparison of EU, non-EU. Now we need time to integrate and to understand really what does it mean and what, how it could impact regulation for these uh, viruses, but also for the little cherry virus too. So this is two examples on what you could do with known viruses with all these genomes, improving diagnostic and understanding better which isolate is present on a territory or not. Now, and as mentioned in the introduction, what do we do with these new viruses, these new sequences? First of all, there was a milestone publication two years ago by a big group of virologists. And they just state and recommend the ICTV to accept any viral sequence as new viral species. What does it mean? I sequence, I take the example, I don't know, I, I sequence a bit of soil, I can reconstruct a virus, I can submit it to ICTV as a new viral species. That means you don't need any, any biological information. This, the sequence is the only information you have on the virus. It is true for environmental virus, for whatever, but also for our plant viruses. This ICTV, in fact, sorry, with the new pest candidate, with the ICTV, you see also a steep increase in the number of virus species accepted. Here is the number of virus species accepted, depending on the time. And you have a clear, also from the 2007, a clear exponential rise. How many viral species exist on Earth, we don't know. We will see in a few years or decade. I hope we will still be actively working when we uh, see the plateau phase of virus uh, discovery, which means that 
we have scanned uh, the viruses infecting uh, plants, at least. So we have more and more viruses, less and less characterized at biological level. In fact, the high throughput sequencing is used now just by 10, from 10 years in R&D. 2009 was the three first publication. It has been widely used in etiology, determining the viruses responsible for the observed symptoms. This led to hundreds of new viruses discovered, and there is still an ongoing uh, public uh, continuous publication of new viruses, and many labs have still a lot of viruses hold in the cast. They do not have time to publish it, simply. Um, to give a practical example on this evolution, I choose to show you the evolution on Prunus uh, species, the number of virus and varoids. If we have a look, on 2012, there were 39 virus species identified, recognized, which means an average discovery rate of 0 0.6 new virus every year. If you look on the time frame between 2012 and 2017, there was eight new viruses, meaning 1.6 new virus per year. And if you look at the very recent literature, in two years we have nine new viral species published for Prunus, which means 4.5 new viral species every year. And a very nice point here is that in addition, often they are mixed with each other which is complicates uh, the, the interpretation also. So what do we do with these orphan viruses? Orphan because we just have a sequence of very few information. Which one of these new plant viruses represent a risk for plant aid and product, trade and production and therefore need to be regulated? For that, uh, we published two years ago in the frame of a cost action, so a networking action, a framework to evaluate this risk, to see how we can efficiently use the resources and the small resources that we have to have a risk evaluation of these new viruses. So let's see on the time frame what's, what we proposed. We first generate the sequence here. Once we have the sequence, usually the laboratory that get it, validate the confirmation, try to assign a taxonomic identification to the new virus candidates. Uh, they complete sample information. Is it an interception? It is in the frame of uh, etiology. We had the disease and we sequence it, and so on. The laboratory may also bibliography. Uh, if we have a taxonomic assignation to certain genus, what's the way of transmission of this genus? Uh, is, is there a lot of uh, emerging viruses in this genus, and so on? This could allow a first consultation or discussion with stakeholders in order to say, oh, this virus may worth additional work. This not, let's put on hold for the moment. This additional work needs more time. And we could say it will be months of work there. We, have, we will have to sequence the full genome to characterize it properly, uh, to set up a diagnostic test in order to be able to scan locally the prevalence of the virus, its association with symptoms, or it is if it's uh, during interception to scan the same kind of commodities that are entering the country, which will allow to deliver more information. And this more information can be also a good opportunity to talk again with the other uh, stakeholders, say, oh, among the three that we have selected, this one seems to be very important, and so they serve a complete characterization which can trigger years because we are going to classical plant pathology with biological assay, which can be very complicated in some case. And for that, there is some kind of postulate for, for having the association with symptoms. What is the host range? What are the vector or the transmission means? Seed, pollen transmitted. You can make also a large survey at regional, but also, also international scale. Okay, but if we go further and try to be still more efficient, could we have like an immediate evaluation of the risk or, or the biological properties of the virus without doing any more laboratory? Based on the genome sequence, what can I interpret? What can I harvest as information only from the genome? For that, uh, we have developed together with ILVO in Belgium and also the collaboration of Wageningen University some uh, 
bioinformatic analysis of the data. But first of all, we can, uh, to introduce this, I will go for human, human viruses. They have more resources often, so in this kind of application, they often are one step further. Here is an important publication in a top scientific journal, and you can read, they predict the reservoir host and the vector in RNA genomes. So they just, using the RNA genomes of viruses, they were, they, they evaluate if they were able to predict accurately the, um, the reservoir and the vector. It is only mammalian single-stranded RNA viruses. They make a huge database containing a series of viruses with the host vector uh, and identity of vector information. This is a lot of bibliography to be done. And they, they start analyzing the genomes, quantitative features in the genomes, I won't go into details, to say, with the genome, can I predict the host, the vector group, and the identity of the vector? Through machine learning, they go in uh, making all the analysis, and what do they observe? They compare, if I, if I just rely on phylogeny, I mean, this virus is, be this is belonging to this genus, they are often transmitted through this way, so I can predict only based on taxonomy. And if you look on taxonomy and phylogeny, they have predictive accuracy, sorry, that is 60% uh, for reservoir host, 95% for vector group, and 67% for vector identity. If we go for this ma machine learning uh, uh, algorithm, uh, analyzing the features of the genomes, they get from 60 to 72% for reservoir host, and from 95 to 99% for vector group. You can say, yeah, it's a rise of 4%, okay. But 4% means 30 to 35 viruses, for which we have a better potential prediction, better prediction of what could be the vectoring or the reservoir host. And in fact, uh, they use it, you know, so they, they build it with all these known viruses, and what they do, what they did in their publication, they apply their new algorithm in order to predict the host and the reservoir of orphan viruses. There are often viruses detected in bats or the mammals. Are there a risk for us, human, or for the, the livestock that we grow? And so, thanks to this information, they can orientate also a little bit the research. Okay, these five viruses seem to be important because of this machine learning algorithm. And they can do, make better decision and better, and they propose to have, with that, better resource allocation. So, the key message they had is taxonomy is already nice. But the genome-based analysis can complete the information. As I told you, it's about 5% for the vector, it's about 12% for the host, but it represents 30 or 100 uh, viruses. You must be aware also that it is about probability, and we rely on what is published, what is on the database to build the model. So that means there are error possible. But anyway, we minimize the risk of error by having so many viruses, and also it can give it can orientate the future research and the risk evaluation in order to be more efficient. So, what we have done uh, with ILVO uh, on that is we, will, we have implemented a similar approach. Could we, from the genome, infer some biological properties of the new viruses? And for that, we must rely on existing information. We get thousands of plant virus genome in the database, we traduce them into protein, the genes into protein, and from this protein, we get some specific information. What is the function? Is there some signature of amino acids which has a specific meaning in terms of uh, molecular biology? What is the 3D conserver structure of all these protein? We characterize all these protein from the genome of the literature, and we get that. So. Uh, I won't go into too detail, but just to show you, we have here the 1,000 different plant viruses existing in the database, and you have hundreds of these function features inferred from the protein sequence. 
the, there is plenty of interest at evolution taxonomy. I won't go into there. What we have done also in collaboration with Wageningen University, we go one by one of these 1,000 virus, what is the transmission means. It's, it took us weeks and months of uh, revising all the bibliography. What, what is the vector of this virus? What is the transmission of this virus and so on? And thanks to that, in fact, we can evaluate if all this genome information, we have the genome information, we have the transmission information, once we put them together, can we predict something? What we have seen, uh, first, we, com sorry, we compared also purely taxonomy. This virus is belonging to the potivirus. What's happening? What's my probability that it is transmitted by aphids? Quite high, actually. And we compare the taxonomy purely with these modules, with this function, uh, applying different machine learning algorithms on it. What we observe, I don't have don't time to have to go to details, but we have similar results, but variation. In some cases, the uh, modules are performing much better. In some cases, taxonomy is performing better. Overall, we have a very good sensitivity and a poor specificity. Globally, the positive prediction value is high. I have this module, the vector is probably, the transmission is like that. At the opposite, the negative predictive value is quite low. I don't have the module, this doesn't mean this is not transmitted by, or this doesn't have this transmission way. Uh, currently, uh, it's a PhD that is, that is finishing with uh, Rashid Tazima, but clearly it's an ongoing story. Uh, we want to go and we'll go further to understand how accurately we can predict transmission or strange symptoms from genome sequence. I finish. So, in conclusion, we are entering the genome era. A lot, a lot of sequence are available and we'll, con we'll continue to produce a lot of sequence. Behind that, we have the, a new stakeholder, which is the bioinformaticians that we need to integrate. Uh, we need to understand what does it mean, the bioinformatic, the bias it can generate and so on. I've tried to show you two examples on which how this genome sequence can improve diagnostic and can improve, can give data for regulation based on the little cherry viruses. And also, if you look on the Solanacea, the new development in protocol allows to make large-scale surveillance of uh, viruses, even uh, uh, tracing back the outbreak origin for viruses or bacteria. And at the end, with a question mark, uh, how far and how useful could be a genome-based preliminary pest risk assessment? How it can orientate the work of characterization uh, immediately after the genome sequence. Um, at the end, I believe we'll, this will improve plant health and promote efficient use, use of resources. And uh, many thanks to the, f the different projects and funders here that allows not us as, as a uh, quite big group to go further and to go uh, to make new discovery and to think around this. And specifically, that all the virologists collaborating in the cost action, the scientists for a Fresco project are all owing this uh, international collaboration, the colleagues from ILVO and also from Uliege. And at the end, I thank you for your attention. Sebastian, before you leave, uh, in the context of the upcoming year in plant health, yeah. I would like you as presenter on behalf of EPO to offer a calendar for next year with Thank interesting you. pests. No genomes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe behind. <laughs> thank you very much. So thank you, Sebastian. Um, we'll immediately go to our next presenter, Adrian Fox from FERA, uh, who will be talking about using, uh, oh, sorry, skipped. Uh, yeah, yeah, so using um, collections uh, and as a resource <laughs> for genomics. And I'm on. Okay. Good morning. Um, thank you to the organisers for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, I think through this talk we'll pick up quite a few of the subjects that we've already touched on through Sebastian's talk um, and possibly explore a few others. And Today what I want to speak about is some of the work that we're doing and some of the work that other people have been doing on looking at historic isolates 
and using those to give context to some of the new findings that we make through next generation sequencing. I'll come back to, um, I'll come back to, to this later. Uh, this is some of the work that we've been doing. And obviously when we write the EPO standard on how to keep a collection, we'll make sure that the rusty tin method is included within that work. So just to give you an overview of the talk, um, I'll be talking about diagnostics as a driver for new species discovery and some of the work we've been doing developing high throughput sequencing for frontline sample diagnosis. I'll talk about using herbaria samples um, and other pathogen collections for investigating pathogen origin and pathways of introduction. And I'll be saying, what do we mean by historic samples in this context? And I'll also give you some background to, to my personal interest in this. And then talk a little bit about some of the hurdles that we still face, and, and that's primarily how we share results. And again, Sebastian touched on the fact that we have hundreds of genomes that are now sitting around and we just physically don't have time to write those up or share them. So I'm a plant virologist. I make no apologies for this being largely focused on plant viruses, but I will touch on other pathogens as we go. Um, if I do touch on other pathogens and mispronounce the Latin, that's because I'm a plant virologist and we don't do Latin. Um, we're, we have a long road of diagnostic development in virology. So less than 150 years ago, we were using Chamberlain filters and we would, pass we would pass infective sap through it. And if the infective sap that passed through was still infectious, we concluded that must be smaller than a bacterium and therefore it must be a virus. And we've come a long way since then. Yeah, we've gone through um, octolone double diffusion and ELISA as serological assays. We've got high throughput molecular extraction methods and PCR and real-time PCR. And we've gone into field diagnostics through lateral flow devices and, and lamp technology. And we arrived today at a point where we've got next generation sequencing now being used as a, a routine or semi-routine frontline diagnostic tool. And we don't throw away many of these old techniques. Okay, we may not do octolone double diffusion as often as we did in the early 1980s, but we still do more than 50% of the testing in my laboratory is ELISA based. So even though we have access to next generation sequencing technology, we don't th throw this old technology away. And we also have some struggles with our extraction techniques. And I don't put the hammer up there for any other reason than we actually do regularly use a hammer in our extraction techniques, especially when you're dealing with seeds. And so we've overcome many of the difficulties in these extraction methods, but now we're creating other problems as we get uh, more data and we get quicker data. So I just want to take a moment to think about what actually drives uh, new virus discovery. Um, and if we look, so this is based on the UK, this is where we've got a good data set for, from my perspective. And if we look over the last 35 years at what's actually driven virus discovery in the UK, and this really maps out first findings and new virus records um, across the different groups of plants that we find them on. And what you find is if you go back to the, the early 1980s and a little bit into the 1990s, you get quite a lot of viruses discovered um, that were in the arable crop rotation. And if we go back to that period, that was the main focus of government research, was looking at arable crop rotations. We had the first finding of things like uh, beet necrotic yellow vein virus in the UK, which sugar beet was used within an arable crop rotation. And so it's hardly a surprise that if you have lots of people studying a specific crop group, then you will find things that you didn't know were there before. We then move a little further forward, and what we have is this large patch here, which relates to findings in ornamentals. Now, this, um, this increase in findings relates to a period where, in the UK, we actually had a 400% increase in ornamental imports coming into the UK. And again, it's not really surprising that if you get a massive increase in a trade, you may also get a massive increase in the number of viruses and other pathogens that come with that trade. But interestingly, that patch also corresponds to a period where we moved largely from serological-based detection to molecular-based detection. And so for the first time, we had the ability to design assays for PCR and real-time PCR as soon as we knew that sequence was there. We could look at the literature and see what was moving in Europe, design PCR assays, and so we could then start searching for things that we knew were on the move, were on the way to the UK, and surprisingly, 
we then found it when we started looking. So we'll call that the, the seek and ye shall find. But the last patch here, this green blob, really represents one afternoon in about 2012 when we first switched on the MySeq to do a field of carrots from just outside York in the UK. And in sequencing 24 carrots, we found seven new viruses from a single field. And so what we actually see in this graph is the impact of research, the impact of trade, but more importantly, the impact of diagnostic development on the discovery of new viruses. So we now have high throughput sequencing in plant pathology. And as I say, we're now at a point that many labs, mine own included, are using this technology in a, a semi-routine way. And we have a range of platforms and approaches. And there have been many key applications of this technology investigated. Um, so you've got HTS-informed diagnostics. So can we improve our PCR sequences by looking at the high throughput sequence and then feeding that back through the diagnostic process? We largely use this technology for dealing with um, iso um, diseases of unknown etiology. We, we've used all of our targeted technologies, our uh, PCR. We've gone to bio bioassay, we've put it on test plants, we've got symptoms, but we still don't know what it is. And at that point, we put it down the high throughput sequencing pipeline. And we're looking at it for megaplex screening. Um, and with that, we're thinking about um, using high throughput sequencing within germplasm screening to try and es essentially show that something is virus free. But I think we're getting to the point that we may have to actually reclassify what we define as virus freedom as we find more and more viruses that we didn't know existed, but may not actually be doing anything. But Given we have these different technologies, and just for an example, um, this is the PAC Bio at DSMZ, which sits in the basement. Um, that's actually a very large sequencer, not a very small Adrian. Um, in the middle, we have the, the MySeq. This is the one that sits on the bench in our research lab. And at the bottom, we have the Minion, the, um, the, the um, nanopore-based um, miniaturized technology for sequencing. And again, this is actually a very small sequencer, not a very large dog. Um, but we have very few studies on the equivalence between these different technologies. We have very few studies on standardization of these different technologies. Not many of these technologies have been validated in the true sense that we mean within the plant health regulatory context. And we even have very few publications covering the adequate use of controls within this technology. And for these reasons, and I think quite understandably, international plant health authorities have concerns about reporting findings from the standalone use of this technology. And that's largely because, as Sebastian's covered already, we flush out many new things we didn't even know existed, and how do you start to deal with risk assessing those new things? So just to cover some ground we've already covered, this is thinking about plant viruses specifically. And if we go back to 1937 and the first textbook on plant virus diseases, at that point, Ken Smith described 51 viruses and virus-like diseases of plants. If we wind forward to the uh, back of an envelope calculation I did yesterday, um, just cutting down the ICTV master list, just those taxa that we know affect plants, I think we're currently at about 1,700 viruses and satellites that we know affect plants. But again, that's the tip of the iceberg. As we've already said, there are many hundreds of viruses that have been discovered that we don't have time to actually publish or chase up, and so we're having to prioritize these. And to just give you an idea of what that looks like, this is a single data set from a small virome study that we did um, looking at the Kenya maize virome. So this was following up work that we did on um, maize lethal necrosis in Kenya and just seeing whether we could chase the, the viruses responsible for maize lethal necrosis around a small holding farm or a couple of small holding farms. And what you see here is that the list of novel plant viruses, the things that we've got nothing to, to relate to, is far longer than the list of known plant viruses. And for the keen-eyed virologists among you, you'll also notice this. So this is an unknown filovirus. Um, it's a fragment, but the filoviruses are the hemorrhagic fevers. I think the one that everyone knows is Ebola. What we're not saying here is that we have a plant infected with Ebola. What we're saying is that we have a trace of a virus from the same genus as a hemorrhagic fever. That is on a plant somewhere on a farm in Africa. And what that's more likely is just bycatch from a passing mammal that's had some interaction with a plant. We won't 
specify what, and that's then left a trace of viral, uh, viral nucleic acid, and we've then picked that up in our sequencing. But the real take-home message from this is that within this study alone, we found nearly four times as many unknowns as knowns. And certainly the more work we do in areas like Africa, where we've got um, little strength of data to fall back on, we find this same pattern emerging, that we find far more unknowns than knowns. And how do we start to deal with this? How do we know which of these are worth assessing? So we think that one source of untapped data are the historic collections. And this paper alone deals with um, herbaria with respect to unknown plant species. And in this paper, it highlights that there's around 70,000 species of plants still to be described. And it estimates that 50% of those species are probably already collected and in herbaria around the world. So if we add to that the, the fungal herbaria and the viral collections that um, were laid down in the 1970s where I've got many in my collection that my predecessor's predecessor laid down as an unknown plant virus. We start to get an idea of just what might actually be already sitting in our hands that could actually inform our current pest risk analysis and our current understanding of viruses. So to give one example outside of virology, um, we all know the story of the potato famine and the accompanying potato moraine in Europe that happened at the same time. Um, a disease that had an impact on the population of Ireland that Ireland still hasn't recovered from. Nearly a quarter of the population either moved or died. And it's also the reason why wherever I go in the world I can get a pint of Guinness. Because that movement of people around the world actually took Irish culture around the world as well. But if we then think pre-1845 and what do we know about um, the, the Herb 1 strain of uh, Phytophthora infestans, the causal agent of potato blight. And in 2014 there was a paper published that actually delved into looking at the herbaria specimens for potato blight and they tracked back that they thought that the origin of that uh, specific strain, which has now largely died out, originated from probably Mexico. And so they trace back to that back to the early mid-1800s, where at some point there was a migration into Europe, and from there, migration across Europe. Within one year, another group had actually dived even further back into the collections and found that actually what they think is that that Herb 1 strain originally came from probably, um, I think they said Bolivia, um, or possibly Peru, and at some point in the early 1800s, there was a, a species transfer onto potato in Mexico. And so what we can actually do, I look at this data and I think, well, that's interesting from an academic point of view, but with a plant health hat on, that's actually a really significant way of doing a pathway analysis for pest risk analysis. But within virology, what do we mean by historic isolates? Um, so how far back can we go in the record? Well, we've got records of um, human and animal viruses going back 7,000 years. But in plant viruses, the oldest one we've got recorded so far is a thousand year old isolate from, from maize. And Marilyn recently sent me a picture of the maize cobs. But these are archaeological findings. And with archaeological findings, you have an issue that you only get nucleic acid preserved where you have suitable storage conditions. So if you're in a high cold desert, where something is in the back of a cave, it's been dry, it's been cold for, for the thousand years it's been sitting there, you've actually got quite a good chance of finding nucleic acid in there that's not too degraded. If you live in York, in the north of England, where it's wet, and okay, we've got a good Viking heritage in York, but if you dig something up from a bog, you're unlikely to get good nucleic acid from it. So with the archaeological record, as I say, there's for fortunate findings. And also, the other issue is that these are single data points. There's no real biological context. And it's difficult to infer that context beyond um, this was a maize cob that somebody a thousand years ago picked up and left for storage. But if we think about the more recent herbaria collections and isolate collections, we have well-preserved isolates. We've got multiple isolates of the same thing. And generally, we have supporting contextual and biological data. And I say hopefully because not all of our isolates are as, as well uh, characterized as they should be, or the data behind them isn't as well recorded as they could be. 
So from my personal point of view, um, our interest started uh, 2014 when, uh, this is Roger Jones from University of Western Australia, and he is, in terms of my job, he is my predecessor's predecessor's predecessor. And when he went to Australia in the 1980s, he left his plant virus collection at Ferro for safekeeping. And genuinely, the best way to keep something if something, somebody's left it to you and bequeathed it to you is keep it in the original tin that he left it with. Because if it's in that tin, everybody recognises the tin and knows exactly where it is. If you put it into your general collection, these things get moved around and you will lose it. So when he then sent us an email in 2014 saying, can we discuss how we can sequence these isolates that I left behind, our first thought was, good grief, I hope we can find them. Then we remembered where the tin was. It was pointed out that somebody at some point had actually rescued it from the side of the autoclave. Um, but we then had this treasure trove of original, in many cases, type isolates that had never been sequenced. And Roger spent some time working at SIP in Peru in the late 70s and early 80s. And so we have many isolates of potatoes and other uh, tuberous crops that actually now are of regulatory interest, which we don't have full genome sequences for. So one of the first pieces of work we did uh, was working with the guys in Peru and Australia and Neil and Ian from uh, our team at Ferra. And we looked at potato virus S. And primarily we were looking for Adrian Gibbs to go back and do um, a dating to look at when you got uh, diversification in the genome of potato virus S. And interestingly what you find is that the diversification of non-South American isolates happens uh, late 1840s, so just after the potato famine. And if we think at this point that many people were bringing in new genotypes of potato to try and breed in Europe to try and get blight resistance within to, to crops. So you had all of these genotypes coming from different regions in South America that had never been in contact with each other, suddenly being crashed together in Europe. And you suddenly get this huge diversity of PVS occurring. But what this also does, if we think about this in a regulatory context, is we think about plant health regulation and that the common potato viruses of non-European origin are 1A1 regulated pathogens. Well, what this starts to do is put some context to that other than where does my potato come from, which is how we currently make that judgment. Because what we can see here is that we have predominantly South American and predominantly non-South American isolates. Now, those non-South American isolates are spread around Europe and Australia and other places, but you can start to see how there may be some sequence-based um, evidence that there is a difference, and therefore we're basing our regulatory decisions on more than just a gut feeling based on where we buy a potato from. The other important thing with this historic data is that quite often this data is associated with biological work. So for all of these old isolates, we also have the old biological characterization, the host range studies and the transmission studies that go along with it. And so we can hopefully circumvent some of the things that Sebastian was talking about by simply using the things we already have in our collection. Where we really got interested in this uh, was two years ago um, when we got this finding in a South American tuber crop called a Eucus. Um, up until that point, I'd never heard of it. I've now become quite familiar with it. I've even learned how to pronounce it properly. Um, but in the summer of 2017, um, the UK MPPO was notified of a crop of this stuff being grown, and it was being sold for seed, but it didn't have the appropriate seed certification. And so for that reason, we pulled it in for a test to have a look at it. But when you look at the literature for what goes into a Eucus tuberosus, what you find is that it's been linked to Andean potato latent virus, 1A1 quarantine, and also linked to potato leaf roll virus which, if that's a non-European strain, that would also be uh, quarantine regulated. When we did our initial ELISA strain, uh, because we agreed at that point that we weren't going to sequence, because if you start sequencing a crop on which you've got no context or background knowledge, and you start finding new viruses, you're in a world of pain when it comes to trying to do those risk assessments. So we did our ELISA tests. We tested for Andean potato latent. We screened with PCR for POSPI viral. And in the first ELISA test we did, we found Andean potato latent virus and potato leaf roll virus. But when we went to sequence those out for confirmation, we couldn't sequence them. So we flipped to high throughput sequencing. And what this showed was that we actually had um, several novel viruses. Uh, certainly they were novel in terms of the sequences we generated. 
but quite a lot of them were very similar to known viruses. And so the, the tree here shows our new viruses from our AUCA samples and the two regulated um, Andean potato latent, Andean potato mild mosaic viruses. And these sit firmly in the middle. And they also sit in a clade of viruses that have only been reported from Solanaceae and only been reported from South America. So from a European plant health context, I think it's safe to take that precautionary principle and assume that these are probably South American viruses and will probably affect solanaceous crops. And for that reason, we started making a fuss about it, aligned with other viruses we found in there. And by the end of 2019, these are on the European legislation as high-risk plant species. Um, so we then have a situation that, well, actually, is what we found new viruses or are they new sequences? And if we look, all of our new viruses align with viruses that have been previously reported. But we now have to try and track down whether these things are kept in historic collections. We've tracked down Alan Brunt's collection and we know that several of these exist. And we're now in the process of trying to transfer them to Ferra and get them sequenced out. Doing it the old fashioned way through biological characterization, uh, we had a student for six months who managed to isolate and start the biological characterization of the papaya mosaic strain. And based on the host range data, we think this is the same virus. But that's six months of hired help because my team don't have time to do that. Whereas if we can get those isolates, we can rely on that historic data. So beyond there, we then started looking at other tuber crops, um, and this links into the Eufresco Pronk project, looking at novel crops within Europe. And we looked back into that collection and we found lots and lots of isolates that didn't have um, sequence data. So we started generating the whole, sequence, the whole genome sequence. And within there, we found this potty virus from Mashua, um, which within um, our internet shopping work that we'd done, so buying things on Amazon and seeing what was in there, we'd found this previously unknown potty virus. But when we looked at our historic collection, we found the same potty virus collected in the Andes in the 1980s. And we can use the biological data from that to assess the risk of the new virus that we've bought on the internet. And that brings us to Virus Curate, which is a Eufresco project which is shortly going to kick off. Um, and what we have is 12 partners, eight countries. And what we want to do is bring together sequencing with collections, with a plant health focus, but do it in a more structured way than we've done it previously, where it's being a little ad, ad hoc. So we want to generate sequence for unsequenced species, and we want to focus on regulatory relevance. And I think what I'd like to do is just quickly flip through an, an example where um, we've already been delving into this. So you've got Plantago asiatica mosaic, uh, which isn't present in the UK apart from the occasional outbreak as far as we're aware. But we've also got this virus, Plantain virus X, that was reported in the 1970s from um, a roadside in Cambridge and from Wellsbourne near the horticultural research station there. And it was widespread at the time of reporting. But the question is, are these the two vi same two viruses? Because we've got no sequence for the, the other plantain virus, the plantain virus X. So we got some of that out of the collection. But we've also got this non-European virus, um, Actinidia virus X, which was reported from kiwi fruit in New Zealand in 2011. Um, and was also intercepted on entry into Canada in 2016 on rye beans. So at a time when EFSA were looking at the viruses that should be regulated, uh, what you have if you look at the literature is a non-European virus of rye beans. So this is ripe for regulation because it poses a threat to European rye beans. Well, actually, if you look, what you find is that the plantain virus that's widespread in the UK and through working with Marlene and Martin Bottomans at Wageningen University, uh, what we also find is it's widespread in the Netherlands as well. And it happens to be exactly the same virus as was found in kiwi fruit in New Zealand and in rye bees on entry to Canada. And therefore, it's probably not a wise idea to have that regulated as a fruit pathogen in Europe, given that it's widespread already in one of the most common weed species that we find in, in Europe. And that paper is currently in, um, in progress. We're writing furiously, but we've got a lot of other things to do with our time. And so we come back to those barriers to progress. Um, we're talking about sharing and reporting. So if we think about the, the work we have at Ferra, we've got nearly 190 near complete genomes of novel viruses that we don't have time to report. 
If you consider that this te technology is now being used for virome studies, where people are going out and doing ecological scale studies, and it's from two of the very early projects, we've got this work of Marilyn Rusink that found nearly 3,000 distinct viruses in two projects. And the problem is we don't have a suitable outlet for publishing these. And that's largely due to time, so the likes of Sebastian, myself, Marlene, and Bart, just don't physically have the time to write these things up, and also the cost of publication. Many of the open access publications are paid to publish. And if we start publishing 190 near complete genomes, even at $1,000 a time, that's my entire budget gone. We won't be doing any more sequencing. So we could stick them on GenBank, and we'll quickly refer to English literature with Rudyard Kipling and the Six Honest Serving Men. However, if you think about GenBank, you may get the what. So what did we sequence? What did we find? And you may get the who, who did it. But what you don't get is the why, the when, the how, and the where, which from a plant health context is the really important information. So we're hoping we've got a reporting solution. Uh, we're talking to the Open Plant Pathology Network about a short-form journal, 300 words, where you get the contextual data, you link it to the GenBank accession, you also hopefully link it to short read archive data. And that will be edited by a community of experts, so more importantly, we don't have the, the reviewing burden either. And it will be open access, it will be online, and more importantly, it will be free. And so just to think about a summary, um, we've got an unparalleled potential for detection of new plant pathogens, and historic isolates may uh, hold a unique data set uh, to help us understand the new findings that we have. But disseminating new findings remains a barrier. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, Erin, for this, uh, this presentation. Um, we'll quickly switch focus to bacteria. I would like to invite uh, Gilles Chalier from ANZES uh, to present her work, of oh, his work, sorry. <laughs> So good morning, everybody. My name is Gilles Cellier. I'm from the ANSES laboratory, located here in uh, Raynan Island, so in the Indian Ocean. We're going to see today some practical use of metagenomics, and especially in the case of the Ralstonia sonoraceum species complex, which will be uh, shortened by RSSC. <coughs> so a few definitions first. Um, the advanced of genomics, defined as the analysis of structure and function of genomes, um, has led to important advances in many fields of uh, phytobacteria research. Comparative genomics has made possible comparison of different uh, sequence genomes to better understand their biological functions through their commonalities, differences, and to study evolutionary history of pests. The case of the RSCC. Um, provides a fitted model for studying plant pathogen interactions, including basic biology of pathogenesis and non-host resistance in the context of an unusually broad host range and latent infections. So what is actually Rolstonia sonoraceum? This is a species complex. It has um, a high genetic diversity associated with a high phenotypic diversity that results in a host range comprising about 250 plant species distributed in 50 different botanical families. Extensive knowledge on species and subspecies assignment is not only of interest in the world of um, taxonomy, but is particularly important when uh, one considers key strategic areas such as plant breeding and agronomy, development of diagnostic methods, and epidemiology. The complexity of the RSCC represents challenge for the accurate characterization of epidemiological strains by official services and research laboratories. The majority of protocol is uh, only focusing on a narrow range of strains, um, brown roots, for example. However, species complex uh, includes strains representing major constraints 
and are under strict regulation with a high, high diversity. Um, <clears throat> so, in the past, dealing with the RSCC meant to speak about races and biovars. Now, they are based on metabolism on plant hosts. So as seen on other pathosystems, this kind of classification was very helpful at this time, but rapidly showed limitations when trying to deal with phylogeny, uh, for instance. In the early 90s, uh, for Wallstonia, I'm, I'm speaking here only, uh, the early 90s saw the first technological breakthrough um, with the PCR technology allowing so specific amplification of DNA portions and lead to the classification of phenotypes and CKVARs based on gene polymorphism. <clears throat> and then quickly came in 2002 the first genome of the Ralstonia that started the, what we call the genomic era and followed by many molecular, uh, bio, biomolecular breakthrough. So the first pen genome in 2010, the first genomic microarray in 2010, same year, MLSA scheme 2012, and MLVA scheme 2013. So over the past decades, uh, genome sequencing of the RSCC strains become more and more needed, affordable, and applied in many research and applied fields, showing this kind of exponential-like uh, tendency. So what have genomics load for the uh, Ralstonia serum serum species complex? It allowed taxonomy of review, reviewing species, mainly through high throughput sequencing and proteomic analysis, unraveling the genetic background of well-known characterized phylogenetically, uh, phylogenetic sorry, line, lineages, and identify lineage-specific features potentially involved in host range variation, but also redefining plant host range relationship for specific lineages through genome sequencing and RNA sequencing and producing massive amount of data on gene content to study epidemiology and for diagnostic application. So all these, these four themes will be presented throughout this presentation, and we highlight the need for more genomic data in many research and diagnostic fields, since without the genomic approach, none of this research field would have been possible. So the first part of the presentation uh, is answering to the question how genomic can help species delineation. So it has been accepted since the 1980s that the different strains of uh, Ralstonia serenitia may show DNA, DNA relatedness value below 70% and therefore might be members of different species as seen in 1980s uh, on the publication of Devos or in 1971 on the publication of uh, Dudorov. So as a result, the term species complex uh, has been applied to Rostonia sonora serum, referring to a cluster of closely related bacteria whose individual members may represent more than one species. So two um, Rostonia serum studies confirm here the classification uh, into three species with two different kind of approach. Safni and colleagues in 2014, the old way, the old fashioned, uh, used phenotypic characterization the wall set fatty acid composition, and the DDH, DNA, DNA hybridization methods. So <clears throat> they conclude that there was a need and they uh, act the fact that there actually is three species in Rastonia serum, but the phenotype microarrays identified major variation in the core metabolism without clear distinction between the three proposed species. So <clears throat> in the contrary of um, viruses when you submit a sequence and you can clearly say that it's a new species as seen in the first presentation. Here we have different um, uh, approach on the bacteria. And the, the work by Prior and al. in uh, 2015 was based here on new technology, the wall genome sequencing, proteomic analysis, and metabolic characterization. Conclusion are the same but we're going to see that uh, the new technology can do the job in a quicker, maybe better way than the old fashioned way. So the full sequence genomes allow to dissect the functional as well as that the genotypic differences in the uh, denitrification metabolism pathway, 
anyway, which is associated with several quantifiable, quantifiable and biologically relevant phenotypic traits that play a major role in virulence, and that was really needed for species delineation. So additionally, we can say that the DDH protocol, the DNA-DNA hybridization, show, showed significant drawbacks as compared with the whole genome sequencing. It's technically difficult. Uh, it is performed only in a few specialized uh, laboratory. It's labor intensive and is prone also to uh, technical errors. So this is um, a phylogenetic tree based on the genomes of the Ralstonia serum serum. And here are the um, clusters, uh, even the species delineated by the uh, genomic methods. The orange, blue, and green cells represent stains cluster into species using criteria specific to any mummy or GGDC methods, which are algorithm for um, um, genome sequences, respectively. Here are the three species. So phenotype 2 on the bottom are the phenotype 2B and 2A Ralstonia serum serum, still the same name. Then two different names for the two other species, Ralstonia pseudo serum serum, gathering the phenotype 1 and 3, and the phenotype 4 is now called Ralstonia sizigi. So <clears throat> the increased availability of genome sequences advanced the development of genomic distance methods to describe bacterial diversity, so the ANI, the MEMI, GGDC, and more to come, I guess. And the results of these fast evolving methods are highly correlated with those of the historically standard DNA-DNA hybridization, GDH techniques. However, these genomic-based methods can be done more rapidly, less expensi expensively, and are less prone to technical and human error. They are thus technically accessible replacements for the uh, species delineation. The genomics applied here uh, to species delineation benefits many different applications, including breeding, uh, plant resistance to bacterial wilt, identification of new pathological variants, management of quarantine organism, whatever is, is, is uh, related for uh, species delineation. The second example uh, will be the question how genomics can help understand host adaptation. So this is the same phylogenetic tree, and um, we're focusing on the phenotype 2 on the left here, which interestingly uh, is gathering many strains of the RSCC and showing the highest number of known ecotypes, which will be the focus here. So what is an ecotype? It's a group of bacteria that are ecologically similar to one another, as defined by Cohen in 2006. So we're going to see the few steps of this um, research in order to highlight the crucial role of the genomics here and to decipher a host pathogen interaction. So we've got three different ecotypes, the MOCO, the NPB, and the brown rot. Here, you can see the mouse. Uh, here you have the, uh, the pathotype associated to this uh, ecotype. So the MOCO is known for affecting bananas, but also solanaceae. The NPB, which means non-pathogenic on, ba on banana, is obviously not pathogenic on banana, but on melon, anthurium, and solanaceae. The brown rot strains, very famous, uh, are able to wield the solanaceae, yes, but also at low temperature, so below 24 Celsius degrees, and solanaceae mainly. So we have common host, solanaceae, and specific host or feature here, the cold uh, aggressivity, here, the melon and the anterium, and here, the banana. So this is really interesting to see how close they are on the phylogenetic tree. For instance, the NPB and the, and the, the MOCO are in the same branch, so Sekevar number four in the phenotype 2B, and the brown rot uh, in green here, uh, Sekevar one. So how to explain significant phenotype traits, differences in spite of close phylogenetic relationship. So we can do it in many ways, but at the start there is um, the genomics, there is the sequencing of, of the genomes. So we have a differential host spectrum here right, with different strains, with banana, and melon, and low uh, solanaceae uh, wilting. So research led to explain, observe what we call 
differential host spectrum or as done toward analysis of the host adapt polymorphism uh, features we can be, which can be assessed by the gene content. Is it present, absent, different? The sequence polymorphisms, what we call the SNPs, for instance, in the genes itself or the promoter regions. Um, the horizontal transfer, because uh, Ralstonia is naturally um, competent for natural transformation or the uh, RNA profiling, so the expression of the genes themselves. Uh, we started with the gene content, of course, which is the easiest way. So <clears throat> among the genes specific to the three ecotypes here, Brownroth, NPD, and uh, MoCo, none were relevant. Surprise. We used 19 genomes. The core genomes, which are the genes that are all present in every genome sequenced is about 2,000 genes. The genome of our Ralstonia, common Ralstonia strain, is 5,500 genes. The pan genome here analyzed well, more than 16,000 genes, which is um, relying on the core genome, of course, but accessory genes, so genes which are not present in every sequence strains of Ralstonia. This study was done. Uh, few years ago, so now we have more genomes, but what was interesting to see is that the specific genes for a brown rot or an NPB is in the 100, and there is no specific genes for a MOCO in this set of genomes. That was very surprising. Um, what was uh, interesting too is to see the uh, subset of uh, variance factors, which could explain the difference of um, um, Host specificity on these on these different ecotypes. So selection of something like 200 variance factors, known or likely associated with variance factor for the pan genome based in the literature, and were anno uh, manually annotated. And these variance factors have a broad range of function during pathogenesis. So including the uh, secretion of uh, and synthesis of type three effectors, for instance, the motility, the chemotaxis synthesis of EPS, so ex exopolysaccharide, degradation of plant set wall, all the set of weapon that the Ralstonia is using to, uh, to wilt the, the plant, actually. So the conclusion is that the few gene content are associated with the host specificity. So we went further in the uh, analysis on the variance factor. Here you have, so the genomes available and the different variance factor and what is, uh, is appearing here so is that they, the type 3 effectors were the most, um, how do we say that, the most uh, diverse uh, within the, uh, the phylogeny of, of the Rostonia serum. This kind of uh, repertoire, type 3 effector, exhibits a high plasticity. They're either absent uh, on many strains so among the pan, what we call the pan effectors, so all the effectors that can be found in Ralstonia serena serum, only 14 are found in every sequence genome here available at these times. So the study of these various factors were uh, deep further into characterization, but to save time in this presentation, let's skip to the conclusion of this research and see how genomic data helped uh, deciphering what was in play during a, um, the host pathogen interaction. <clears throat> so the deep genome analysis is the key to understand this species complex pan pathogen. And the, the conclusion here was that, of course, few gene content associated with host specificity. Um, so identif that was identified very early in this, in this research. And that was a surprise for us because in, in other pathosystems, it was kind of the easiest way to uh, understand the key role of the genes associated with uh, a defined uh, host specificity. So, however, several type 3 effectors were associated with the MOCO, the NPB, and the broadward ecotypes. And most differences between strains um, involve host adapted polymorphism of an uncertain biological significance. But many were located in, in genes associated with bacteria wilt virulence. An important um, proportion of these candidate genes are related to regulatory function, suggesting that the host range could evolve through 
uh, changing, changes sorry, in, uh, in regulation. The transcriptomic analysis reveals significant differences between these ecotypes. MOCO and PB strains exhibited much more divergent uh, transcriptomic profile than might have been predicted by the phylogeny and the gene content. So genomic helps here understanding pathogen evolution and can predict also biological feature of a given ecotype, especially when it's uh, difficult to size the uh, specificity, specificity origin linked with the uh, host pathogen. Third example here is how genomic can improve the diagnostic field. We'll see that through two different examples. The uh, production of a diagnostic PCR for differentiating the MOCO and the NPB ecotype and um, the research and diagnostic microarrays, which has been set up a long time ago uh, on the RSCC. So the first example on the uh, setup of the PCR. Uh, we use the, um, the um, platform of the Genoscope from the CEA in France, basic tool like the BLAST GDB and uh, their MAGE, MAGE interface, which is an annotation system for a genome organism. And at this time, we had 26 uh, genomes available, nine from MOCO and three from NPB. So as seen previously, a few differences in gene content can be observed between the MOCO and the NPB ecotypes, and especially between uh, Rostonia serum strains that exhibit biological characteristics which are very different. However, two candidate genes were selected uh, for diagnostic purpose based on these uh, sequenced genomes uh, that were used to differentiate the MOCO and the uh, ecotype. That was an integrase recombinase like protein and a binding protein carefe A like, whatever, two genes had been selected. And this platform well, was very helpful for us because we can select one genome and one, one set of genome, one another set of genome, subtract genes, add etc. to see what is very specific and what is it is not. Um, so this is, actually this was the uh, protocol for um, analyzing samples arriving in the lab uh, for trying to size if it's Ralstonia serum or not. And when we received ben um, bena bananas, for example, we could only said at this time Officially, it was Rolstonia soranacera. We didn't know it, if it was further moco, a different type of moco, etc. So based, based on sequence genome analysis, we were able to enhance the detection of two phylogenetically uh, related ecotypes that can be found on different host plants. Uh, for the moco strains and the variant um, on the NPB strains, uh, because Ralstonia could be found in, into water and only saying that it's Ralstonia is not enough for us. We have to, to size uh, the um, epidemiologically um, uh, potential of this strain. So it was very helpful to uh, push further than it's Ralstonia on this. So it led to a production of a French national analysis method for the detection of MOCO and PP ecotypes. And this method is now referenced in the revised EPPO diagnostic standard, PM set 21, exactly. The second example uh, is the research and the diagnostic microarrays we set up using these uh, genomes available. So the microarray technology was used because we can simultaneously detect and quantify thousands of hybridization events. In, in a single reaction, actually. It can test for a multitude organism, can screen for all biosecurity risks for a specific host, and has a great scope for miniaturization, high throughput application, and development of integrated and automated systems. The first microarray we set up with genomes uh, was in 2010, and it was uh, research-oriented. It was based on only six, at this time, fully sequenced strains, and has something like 11,000 um, probes. So it was set up in my, in my former um, uh, research team, and it was uh, dedicated to the exploration of the RSCC uh, genomes. So we're using the microarray 
on based on, on a few sequence genome to analyze other genomes. So only on genes that has been of, uh, already discovered in, the, in these genomes. We were seeking for uh, fundamental knowledge on strains, diversity, and epidemiology. Um, this design allowed us to compare and assess each strains um, and ecotypes within the phylogeny of Rostenia serum just in a fashion like a, a barcode, actually. The diagnostic array that was set up a little bit later was based here on 28 genomes, um, based so on 17 major um, pathogenic and genetic subgroups. So including, of course, the phenotypes, the Bronaut, Moco, the NPB, which was um, a big case at this time. We selected some probes, but it ate them on um, a first prototype, an eight array glass slide that you can see on the right. And finally, we selected the 100 best probes in duplicate. So all of this was based on genomic data and specific selection of, of uh, what we call CDS is actually a, a gene, gene sequence. The final, um, the final setup was the diagnostic array technology, which can lie into a tube. It's a micro-reaction vial containing probe-based array chip at the bottom on the three millimeters uh, square. Uh, it's pretty basic. We have a conjugation with uh, amplified DNA, which, are, which is labeled. Current recreation, scanning, and data analysis. It's pretty neat. And we had this um, production of 35 validate probes and duplicated that can scan all the diversity, the major groups of Rostonia solana serum. And um, it was multiplexed into a single reaction for uh, all the species complex. It's dedicated to, um, to, pro to diagnostic and cost around 60 euros and it has the evolutive design, which is very helpful for uh, epidemiologically um, a relevant tool. So this is faster and more precise protocol development thanks to the genomics. It has production of dedicated diagnostic tool for broad um, and specific strain tracking, creation of new application for epidemiological purpose, and increasing productivity and scientific developments toward better and safer plant health. So it allows to fit diagnostic application are useful for disease management. Producing of diagnostic tools adapt for the most advanced uh, scientific findings to be up to date and for providing guidance for uh, decision makers. The last example quickly was the um, application on epidemiology. So the availability of genetic data has enabled detailed analysis uh, for the presence of what we call repetitive DNA short sequence repeat characteristic. This is illustrated here in a sequence TT, CCC, GG, which is repeated n times on a specific uh, location of the genomes, for instance, of Rolstonia, what we call the BNTR. We amplify them and it has a quick and very quick evolution of this pattern. So the n times is analyzed uh, not on the polymorphism, but on the size of this, uh, uh, of this replication. So we applied here what we call an MLVA uh, methods. It's called the Multilocus uh, Variable Number Tandem Repeat Analysis. And it's based on the, uh, so on the size uh, comparison, and we scattered some uh, BNTR all around the genomes to analyze this. So these are very variable sequence. <clears throat> which the size of units can vary from a few base to more than uh, from hundreds of them and represent rapidly evolving epidemiological um, uh, markers. Sorry. So based on only on EGL, for example, we have on phenotype one applied to a specific uh, analysis, a few groups represented here. Based on MLST, which means not, not on only one gene sequence, but for instance, eight gene sequenced, we can uh, find more groups within the same uh, phylogenetic signal, so the resolution is enhanced. But with this MLVA scheme, we went further this, and from 14 here ST groups, we had these 45 MT groups. For, so talking about epidemiology, we have a thinner resolution and a better strength of uh, tracking strange epidemiology. 
And of course, the phylogeny is conserved. The signal here is, is, is really pre pretty neat conserved. What we can do here is this kind of, of network, relationship network, with, which is called the complex, a clonal complex. And among here, a thousand of strains represented here in the Indian Ocean, for instance, we can track the epidemiological relevant strains. So 1,300 uh, strains analyzed here, 800 belong to these clonal complexes, which is pretty diverse, for instance. And here we've got the half of the strains which are located here in this specific, uh, what we call MT, specific type of haplotype, meaning that we can track the, the, the founder haplotype of this uh, um, epidemic across the Indian Ocean. Few specific clusters are present, uh, especially linked to Mauritius. But this was a big deal to discover that. So genomic allow data to look deep inside pathogen key evolution markers and help the identification of emerging clones, for instance here, that escape control strategies and to trace bacterial strains that are important for the protection of agriculture. Finite words. So how we did manage the genomic data in others? So of course, we share data. We store that at NCBI for the genomes or on the Genoscope um, platform. We use personal and pipelines, uh, which are uh, scripts, sorry, which are published and uh, fully available upon request. And all of these data are publicly available. Even the strains are um, deposited into the CFPP uh, database. So <clears throat> I may state the obvious, but relying on the genomic approach increases the amount of genomic data which um, obtain, and this is exactly what is needed for genomics. The inflating genomic database can improve researchers' understanding of the species diversity and evolution in history resulting in a better taxonomic assignment uh, for ambiguously identified pests, a better appraisal of the impact of the pest genetic diversity, and a better design of target molecular tests. So I like to stress here the importance of producing clean data shared among inter inst international institutions. And we need to think how to implement new metagenomic approaches in our daily work to improve the scientific knowledge and produce strong scenario for the disease management and containment. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me. And thank you for, uh, uh, for Florent Yu and the late Philippe Prior for um, sharing data and participating to all these uh, researches. Thank you, Cyril, for your uh, presentation. And uh, before we break for coffee, I would like to have a, another round of applause for all the presenters of this morning's session. <laughs> now we break for coffee and uh, come back at 11. <laughs>